keep your own records, just like you got to keep your own keys. It's that kind of mentality. The Australian tax system is built so you're guilty until proven innocent. It's no defence to say I didn't think that they were going to find out. And we see a lot of people just get absolutely smoked. Welcome to the video. I'm John O'Loughlin, the APAC Managing Director and Country Director Australia for Coinbase. Today we have with us uh, Shane Brunette, uh, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Crypto Tax Calculator, uh, also a Coinbase Ventures portfolio company. With uh, Shane today is Harrison Dell, um, founder of Cardane Legal uh, and an advisor uh, to Crypto Tax Calculator, formerly with the ATO, the Australian Tax Office. And we're going to have uh, a super lively session today and walk you through um, on-chain tax. So guys, how are you going today? Really good, John. Thanks for having us here. Good to be here. Full disclosure, disclaimer, safe harbor statement. This video is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as tax, legal or financial advice. So you heard it from me here, top of the hour. Um, this is an educational video. Shane Harrison, today we're driving into on-chain crypto tax. What constitutes an on-chain transaction? And what makes those types of transactions so unique and special? Yeah, it's a good question, John. I think um, when you're doing an on-chain transaction, that's really a direct interaction with the blockchain where there isn't a traditional third-party middleman. Like one of the basic requirements for capital gains tax record keeping is that you identify the party that you're dealing with. And on-chain transactions, you run into the first problem is it's all pseudo-anonymous in that you're dealing with a liquidity pool or you're dealing with a wallet that you don't know who owns it. Therefore, even that base level of record keeping is actually impossible. And there is some guidance around this, but not really enough to give people certainty about how these peer-to-peer -peer essentially transactions are gonna work for tax purposes. I just wanted to give people a little bit of an insight into how regulators in Australia are looking at this. Shane, how do you see the ATO kind of evolving? I know your teams go around the world visiting the IRS, Her Majesty's Customs, going to conferences. You run a tax platform. Can you take us through what you've witnessed in terms of the ATO's journey and how they look at crypto? Yeah, I think to be honest, you know, the ATO is actually quite advanced in their perspective on crypto compared to other tax authorities around the world. They were one of the first to come up with some pretty sophisticated guidelines around staking rewards, airdrops, etc., and published that on their website. Um, so in fairness, they have been ahead of the curve. Uh, I, th I think there's still a lot to be desired in the space, and I think that's just related to how quickly the technology actually moves. If you look into um, DeFi, um, or if you look into NFTs, if you're active in DeFi and you're active in the NFT space, possibly not as much this year as late last year, um, are the ATO taxing this stuff? Everything is on the blockchain, right? So if you think about crypto, the biggest rumor or misdirection you'll ever hear is, oh, it's anonymous, that you know the government doesn't know, how will they know? And the thing is, every time you do a transaction, particularly something that's on chain, it's published to a public record, it's called the blockchain. The entire structure of the blockchain is meant to keep this information secure, immutable and transparent. So anyone, including a government office, can have a look at this data and try to work out what's going on. And, you know, maybe the government doesn't have internal capabilities to do that thoroughly, but then they rely on third parties. That's how they always do it. And so you're really talking about private market participants helping the government understand the crypto, you know, transactions. They already do this a lot with KYC, AML compliance, and tax is just a, an extension of this. So to think that you could do activity on chain and it's not going to be taxed or, you know, it's tax free, the government never knows. It's just a... Uh, it's a really quick way to get yourself into trouble. Can we get a, uh, a few words out of a lawyer on this? Yeah, of course, I have a lot to say. If your only defense is privacy, if your only structuring, your only tax planning is the ATO isn't gonna know, you're very deep in the realms of tax avoidance, potentially in the realm of tax evasion. And this is on par with setting up companies overseas that you hope no one's ever gonna find. It's the same mentality and the government doesn't like privacy on your finances. You can have some privacy, but transacting in an anonymous way on the blockchain, first of all, it's not possible. 
because once your address is linked to your profile, your name, everything you've ever done on that address can clearly be seen. And even if it's 10 years in the future, where they see that you bought Bitcoin for a dollar and sold it for 60,000 and you never reported it, they will go after you for tax evasion. They will go after you for tax avoidance. It's no defense to say, I didn't think that they were gonna find out. Let's talk about a crypto to crypto trade in a decentralized environment. So going from a wallet. Um, if that's happening in Australia, will the ATO see that? Will they try to track it? Will they tax it? Do they even know about that? We talk about that flow of funds. Yeah, so if you're doing any type of activity, especially on a DEX, whether you're in Australia or any other com country, the, the transaction is going to be published to the blockchain. And you could see the smart contract address, you could see the funds being transferred from your centralized exchange to your wallet that funds the transaction in the first place. So everything is visible and it's going to be on record for when you get an audit and you're going to get questions raised if you're not declaring these types of activities. From a, from a tax perspective, the actual direct trade of crypto to crypto, that's quite similar to the traditional sense. The biggest difference is that there isn't a third party intermediary. So, you know, there isn't somebody at the end of the day who can provide you with a tax statement because there isn't this third party keeping track of everything. Instead, you've got to pull it from the blockchain. And so that's where, you know, something like crypto tax calculator comes in because we are that third party because the decentralized exchange or Satoshi isn't going to provide you with the tax statements. You've got to keep your own records, just like you've got to keep your own keys and keep your own funds. It's that kind of mentality. It's good to remember that the Australian tax system is built so you're guilty until proven innocent. People need to take great care in keeping their records. It's, it's the same as if you're buying shares or you're buying real estate. If you're dealing with crypto, you need to keep the records. The ATO doesn't have to keep them for you. They don't have to prove their case. You have to prove what your amount of tax should be. Otherwise, they will essentially make it up and they're not very lenient. What about gas fees? How are gas fees treated by the ATO? That's kind of in the weeds, I suppose, around how complex decentralized activity can actually be. Let's use an easy example. You might be selling Bitcoin for XRP, for whatever reason, on this imaginary blockchain, and you're paying for the gas fee in Ethereum. And so this is a bit like imagining that you're selling Google stock for Tesla stock but then you're paying for the commission, the, the fee commission in Apple stock. And so you've got to also think about, well, you know, what was the purchase price of that Apple stock? You know, how you've got to keep track of that, not just the purchase price of the Bitcoin that you're selling for XRP, but also you really got two disposals there, one of Bitcoin and one of Ethereum um, to pay for this XRP. And then you've got complexities around this fee, can I realize this entire fee today? Or do I have to do, you know, 50-50? What kind of rules would you would you put on this fee? And you know, you need to make sure you, that you do it consistently because the ATO, they hate inconsistency and they hate when you try to manipulate, you know, some of these kind of in the weed type of rules to your advantage at this time. So you've got to show some consistency there. It's just, it's basically totally impossible. If you're going to try to do it on a pen and paper or in an Excel, it's just a quick way to lose hair very quickly. And really you've got to go to a, a tax solution, like a tax software platform like Crypto Tax Calculator that can kind of, you know, we, we write the program once and then it's done. And that pulls in all that information and it does those calculations for you. This is where CTC is going to come in with that, with that program and that software for you and help help sort this stuff out. I mean, to me, somewhat of my level of competence, this is a no brainer. Let's talk about on-chain activity, how that's been increasing in recent years. Clearly, uh, with lots of tokens that are issued, um, you know, liquidity is kind of at the backbone um, of this business, um, particularly for decentralized protocols. How's the ATO gonna look at you providing liquidity to a pool of liquidity from a tax perspective? The, the best example is the Uniswap V2. Um, going beyond that, things get a lot more complicated. But just on that basic example of Uniswap V2, which most exchanges, most decentralized exchanges work with at the moment, you might take a wrapped Bitcoin and an Ether token on the Ethereum blockchain. 
you'd swap them both in the smart contract to a new LP token. That sounds like a disposal event to me. The ATO has confirmed that's their view as well. And then when you stake it in the smart contract, there's a question about whether that is an additional disposal event and you've realized tax in at least two different triggers, which doesn't make much commercial, commercial sense. We're looking at very foundational capital gains tax issues here, which don't come up for the everyday Australian dealing with cash. But when you start paying for stuff with other stuff, you run into these problems. Even the accruing the fees from the automated market maker in your LP tokens, it's not sufficiently clear all the time when those amounts are income and when they're you know, not derived until you withdraw them from the liquidity pool. And you need to at least have a tax strategy to be consistent. As Shane said earlier, inconsistency is going to scream non-compliance. It sounds like when you lend in, in crypto, you're providing this liquidity, most of these things will, will trigger a capital gains event. Yes, right? and the, the ATO has said, as, as simple as a token to token exchange would be a capital gains tax event. The biggest question, and I think if you step back from things like liquidity pools and staking, the question is whether using a smart contract is a capital gains tax event. If I put one Ether into a smart contract to stake it or whatever it's going to happen, the question is, have I retained beneficial ownership? Is that still my Ether? And in some cases, it's clearly no. In other cases, it might be yes. In a lot of cases, we don't know. There's been questions raised about if it's going into a big pool, you can't point to your Ether, nor does the blockchain allow you to do that. Uh, at least most blockchains, you can't say, here is my ERC20 token going through because how the technology operates is account balances increase and decrease. It doesn't actually flow. Uh, and that complexity hasn't been dealt with to the ATO. So they just default to the likely correct that pretty much doing anything with crypto will have a capital gains tax implication, which is what crypto tax calculator picks these up and suggests what it may be. It says, this looks like a staking transaction. And you can decide whether you want to be more conservative and say, I'm going to treat these all as trigger events, which does things like realize tax, importantly, reset the 50% CGT discount, can have lots of flow on implications, which will flow into the rest of your report. Or you want to take a more aggressive view, or you want to take advice from someone like myself or your accountant to go, well, these transactions have these characteristics. And I believe you can even leave notes on your report so that you can actually recall why you made these changes. So that if the ATO does come knocking and say, what are you doing here? You're number one, consistent. But number two, you have records for why you've made adjustments to your report and why you think certain things. So I don't think this is some new area people need to be concerned about. It's just about how do you tweak your lens for this level of transparency? Um, I certainly saw it moving back to Australia a decade ago. I was reconciling uh, 401ks, UK pension, equities everywhere and the ATO had zero tolerance for uh, maybe the argument that I had this very complex situation. That to them was irrelevant. I just had to be compliant in this jurisdiction. How do we think about uh, Ethereum deposits in staking versus rewards and how the ATO look at those two things? Say you're depositing into a, uh, a pooling service such as Rocket Pool, Lido, Swell Network. The question arises of whether if I put one ETH in, is that still my one ETH? And that's a valid question. And the ATO hasn't answered that question. And the, the basic tax law view will be, well, yes, because you can't say here's mine. You generally can't point to a nominee arrangement. You can't point to a bear trust arrangement. There are very few terms and conditions on these sorts of services. It, it is very trust backed. And while, you know, if you buy some ETH and then you stake it, you're not going to have a big capital gains tax problem. If you've had the ETH for quite a long time and then you stake it, then you've got two problems. Number one, it's a tax trigger event, either a gain, maybe a loss, that's fine considering the market right now. But also if, it, if that resets your 50% CGT discount, when you do sell that ETH one day, you've got a problem in that you might be paying twice as much tax as you were expecting. You may not be prepared for that in terms of your budgeting for your tax as everyone should be doing. You know, while it's a simple question of Ethereum staking, lots of tax implications, the how you do it can have massive impacts. And these are things that accountants can't foresee and even tax lawyers can't foresee going into these. 
we are all work, working retrospectively, figuring these things out. Yeah, and to go into some specific examples, for example, you've got Rocket, I think it's Rocket ETH, which is you really buy into the token and then it accrues in value. Um, but you do, you're not getting a distribution every mm -hmm. day. And so that might be treated quite differently to something which I think is ST ETH, where it's kind of rebasing every 24 hours and you're getting that ownership over the token in real time, like on, on the fees. And so it is quite nuanced and particular. From a calculation point of view, if you're receiving a reward into your wallet, that's pretty clear from the ATO guidelines today that that would be treated similar to interest or income basically, where it's really like, the, the way that I think about it in my head is say you've got a $10 reward that comes into your wallet, like $10 of interest. Really what it's like is you have received $10 of Australian dollars and then you went out and immediately bought the crypto. That's kind of actually how the, the calculation or the bookkeeping works from a tax point of view. And so you could have, you know, $10 come into your wallet every day and that's like you're earning $10 every day in you know, miscellaneous income basically, and you're immediately buying it for ETH or whatever. Getting back to NFTs, um, clearly, you know, there's still a little bit of um, concern around, you know, what's a fungible versus a non-fungible um, kind of activity. Just talk about any special treatment that the ATO has given to NFTs, because I know there's been some more guidance on this recently. The, the main difference between an ERC-20 token and an ERC-721 or any other standard where you can actually track a specific token via the blockchain and see where it's gone, is you can potentially say, this wasn't a disposal, this is being held in a, in a, in a leveraged arrangement, it's being held in a loan arrangement, arguments that you can't make with ERC-20 tokens. So there are some differences and I like to think of ERC-20 tokens like cash. I can't track which single dollar has gone through different bank accounts. But when I look at shares and the number on those shares, you can see where share number 57 has been ever since issuance if you look hard enough. And the blockchain is a great way to see where it's moved. Most at risk are founders of NFT projects, but people who are trading and dealing in NFTs need to make sure that they at least ask the question of their advisors, should I be registered for GST? Thanks for that clarity. One final bit of advice on tax obligations as they refer to crypto, something we haven't talked about thus far. What would be another thing for crypto users out there to be thinking about? I think uh, keeping aside tax when you're actually <clears throat> doing the activities, really important. Um, we see situations where you might receive quite a lot of money in staking rewards and then that, those assets that you receive go down to zero dollars. A token, it's not really got that much inherent value, but at the time receipt it was maybe hundred thousand dollars, and now it's zero dollars, and you can't actually offset that um, capital loss against the revenue that you made on the receipt of the token. So you, you've really got to think about the tax consequences of what you're doing. What you should do is be setting aside. Um, Similar to pay-as-you-go, when you receive income, you should set aside money on receipt so that you can pay for the tax. Because that, that asset that you've essentially bought on the, at the time of receipt, that could just be worthless at some point. You don't know. So you really got to have that money aside because otherwise you're just taking a risk from a tax perspective. And we see a lot of people just get absolutely smoked by this and they haven't thought about their tax consequences up front. And it's... Just like if you if you think about profit, you know what's the profit on this trade? You should be thinking about what's the tax because at the end of the day, you care about your net profit, not your gross profit. This has been a great session, particularly educational for, for myself. Uh, but thanks to to Kyle and Legal and Crypto Tax Calculator, we're going to wrap it up today. Where can people find you? What's the easiest way to get access to this information? Crypto Tax Calculator. Uh, just look it up on Google, CryptoTaxCalculator.io, um, and then you could sign up for free plug in all your wallets, pull in all your transactions, actually see how the calculations are being made. And that's all done without having to pay a cent. And only when you want to generate your reports do you need to have to pay. In. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on TikTok, uh, Harry Dell Tax Talk, my law firm website, cadenalegal.com.au. 
even if you don't need me, if you need a referral to a tax accountant that knows what they're doing, you can ask either Crypto Tax Calculator or myself, and we're happy to put you in contact with someone. Thanks everyone. Uh, I think the watchword and lesson there is get organized. Uh, Cardano Legal, Crypto Tax Calculator, Coinbase, um, all here to help you. Super interesting session. Looking forward to coming back uh, with more educational videos soon. Thanks.